Hello, Fighting Scots. It's Hannah Maher, Vice President for Development and College Relations, coming to you again on our Scots Day of Giving, our fourth annual Scots Day on April 16th. We're so glad to see many of you joining us throughout the day. Uh, we've got a lot of social posts on our Facebook page, our Instagram page, and we've been loving the love you're giving us. So we appreciate it. Please keep it up. If you want to follow more updates specific to the day, you can visit our website, which is monmouthcollege.edu slash scottsday. But again, this has been the largest alumni virtual event we've ever had, and we want to continue it. It's 18 hours and 53 minutes today to honor our heritage and traditions. We want to see your stories, your Monmouth moments, your photos, the ones with the, the big hair, the crazy clothes, whatever it might be. Please share them. Um, share some advice and some love to our current students and especially our seniors right now as well. We want to see how, how big our Mammoth Network is and really show them what Tartan Nation can do. So we hope you'll continue to engage with us, connect with your own Fighting Scots Networks, uh, create your own Zoom events later this afternoon and join and share those photos too. So we, uh, again, appreciate the love you're giving us and, and just want to continue to provide you all with some updates. You'll see I've got some uh, familiar faces joining me, a few Mammoth alumni and one of our professors here in the kinesiology department. So first, thanks to you all for joining me. I'd like to just go around and have everyone give a little introduction of themselves so our folks watching know who's joining us. And then we have a few questions we'd like to address. So I'm gonna start first with Stephanie Baker. Hi, I'm Stephanie Baker. I'm a alum of 2015. I graduated with degrees in chemistry and biochemistry. I currently live in Kansas City in my first year of family medicine residency um, through um, HCA. Wonderful. Thank you, Stephanie. I'll jump down to Professor Shum. Yes, uh, I'm Sean Shum. Um, I actually have a bachelor's degree in nutrition and dietetics, and my graduate degrees are in exercise physiology and biological sciences. Um, in between those undergraduate and graduate degrees, I also spent some time um, in the Air Force actually working in a large teaching hospital as well as an outpatient um, wellness center. So, uh, academic background as well as some actual experience working in a healthcare system. And Dr. Dolan, I'd like you to go ahead and give your introduction. Hi, I'm Moira Dolan. I'm a 1980 graduate majoring in chemistry and English. I'm board certified internal medicine physician in private practice in Austin, Texas. I'm also uh, an author with a few books that you can get on Amazon. And uh, my passion is basically patient empowerment. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, all of you, for joining me today. Um, I know we're all not unique in the situation, but I know several of you really are experiencing some of this firsthand. So we appreciate all that you're doing to help educate folks, to help treat folks out there that are experiencing the COVID-19. Um, and again, just our thanks to all of you. Um, Moira, I thought I would start with you and just ask, how has your work been affected currently? What are you seeing in this current climate? And are, I know you do a lot of publications to help inform um, you know, consumers and, and patients and folks about medical opportunities. Uh, are you seeing an increase in the, the demand for content and the publications that you're putting out? Uh, yeah, definitely. For one thing, I'm getting something like two or three per hour, day and night, links sent to me uh, asking me to validate or refute or substantiate what about this, what about that, what about gloves, what about masks, what about these statistics, what do you think, what about this herb, this medication, whatever, and that's quite a bit to keep up with. But there's also a tremendous number of the worried well. You know, already uh, pharma spends about half a billion, that's B billion dollars per year, on uh, advertising diseases on, on television, basically, without any even specific reference to, to medication in order to get people to go check with your doctor, you might have this dread disease. And of course, we've got the only patented treatment for it. But now with this COVID-19, we see a tremendous number of worried well that the slightest cough or sneeze is like, could this be it? Uh, and, and, and that's the biggest thing I'm dealing with. Gotcha. 
Stephanie, um, I know you are currently in the office working, so we appreciate that and hope you won't get paged away. You are currently on the you know, front line seeing patients and, and working. Can you talk a little bit about what that experience has been like? Um, and then also just, you know, are, are there concerns you have or precautions you have to take when you go home to your family? Yeah, so, so used to, we came to work, we just came in the front door and we started seeing patients. Now we get our temperature taken at the door every day. We get a mask, which we have to wear 24 seven unless we're eating. We get a little sticker that we put on our shirt that proves that we had our temperature taken. Um, there are specific rooms, specific areas designated for coronavirus patients. Our residency has done a really good job of trying to protect us from sort of being exposed too much. Unfortunately, we've had a couple of residents that have tested positive for COVID-19. So, um, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of hand washing. We're doing a lot of full protective gear and any patient that's got a cough or any, um, any patient that we're concerned for coronavirus. But it's definitely changed the, the flow of medicine. It's changed the way that we're being taught and educated just because there's a lot more limited patient contact in some areas. Wow. It's, it's when you put it in words like that, I, you know, you realize there's certainly precautions that are being taken, but um, we all don't know what those are. So thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. I, for, I forgot to say you had asked um, what I do before I go home. So we get hospital issued scrubs for work. And so I go down to the second floor and I change out of my dirty scrubs into my clean scrubs before I get in the car. And then when I get home, I shower before I say hi to my husband so that I can try not to expose him to anything that I've been exposed to here. Um, and that makes us both feel a little bit better. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Well, and I think those, I'm sure those precautions are, again, as they make you feel better, they're, they're there for a reason as well. Um, Professor Shum, I, I know right now, you know, I'm sitting here in the alumni house on an empty campus um, and wish it was not that way. Uh, I know you're working remotely, just like the rest of the staff and faculty um, and our students are doing remote learning. Can you talk a little bit about for remote work? training, you know, the students, remote learning, remote teaching, um, and a little bit more about Sorry, I, I, have, I have to leave. I'm sorry. Not a problem. Thanks, Stephanie. Have a good day. Yes, uh, the remote learning, you know, um, I know many of our students have probably felt very challenged, and I can assure them that I have been just as challenged trying to figure this thing out as they have been. Um, so, you know, I, I think the biggest thing has really been to try to really figure out, you know, what, what are the key things that I really want the students to know or at least be exposed to for the second half of the course that they're in? Because it's essentially half a semester that we've, we've been dealing with. So, um, you know, that's how that process went for me. Uh, personally, and, and especially we've been, you know, we've gotten a fair amount of feedback from students individually, but collectively as well that have come through the faculty and through the dean, um, that many students feel overwhelmed and there's just a lot of life stress right now. And again, I feel the same thing. I'm trying to, you know, educate my two kids at home while I'm trying to work and manage everything here, um, as well as run my courses. So, um, Really, it's been a matter of trying to, you know, in this case, find out the bare essentials that the students need, uh, figure out, you know, what is the easiest and best way to deliver that. Uh, so in this case, the way I would deliver an online course is actually probably significantly different than the way I would deliver it if I had planned ahead of time for an online course and everyone had signed up for an online course. Uh, many of our students have situations where they may not have internet access all the time, or it may be sporadic, or it may not be particularly powerful or robust. So uh, again, I have resisted the urge to do anything too exotic or high tech, quite honestly. Um, it's different video links and articles and things that I feel like contain the key information. I'll have the students summarize that, and then I can, I can have have them do online quizzes and exams that make them go search those sources for the right information. Uh, but it also doesn't require them to be on the computer or online at a specific day or time with a hard schedule because many of them have to share those resources with siblings, with parents. Some of our students may have to be working to support their households because of the, the economic impact of this. So um, I've tried to be as sensitive as I possibly can to to that, 
Uh, and, and so far in my courses, my students have done pretty well. They, you know, they're, they're, the stuff I'm asking them to do, they're doing, and they're doing pretty well, um, even though I, I realize some of them have some pretty challenging circumstances. Yeah. Well, our hat's off to you and the rest of the faculty who made such a quick leap. You know, what has been a residential experience, um, we had to really convert quickly. Um, but you guys are doing a wonderful job, really. We, I know, appreciate all of that. Um, can you also share a little bit more with us? So a few years ago, Monmouth College added a global public health minor to its curriculum and, and has that program already in place. And right now that seems very relevant. Can you talk a little bit more about that program? Yes, uh, yeah. In particular, that program, the, the two sort of, you know, classes absolutely required for the minor are Intro to Public Health and Epidemiology, both of which are pretty timely uh, at this point. And obviously, we're going to have lots of very updated information to present and, and real life examples to present in those courses, uh, you know, in the future. So you have those couple of courses. We also want our students to do some experiential learning as part of that. And then they've got the option to take a variety of other courses that can count towards the minor, um, you know, based on their interests and their goals. So, uh, you know, there are some, you know, those who have more of a, an interest in something like medical school or something along those lines. There are electives within the minor that those those students would naturally be taking. There are courses, you know, exercise science courses that, that I would teach in my department that would fit in there. There are courses across campus that fit in there. So uh, they all have a baseline of basic public health and epidemiology information, but then we sort of let the student individualize the experience in the minor based on, you know, public health is a huge sort of umbrella of different things that it could entail. So, um, like many of the things we try to do here, um, we really tried to build it with um, flexibility and the ability to sort of customize the experience and the background that the student gets so, um, you know, so that they can get the skills and experiences they want and that they need for whatever their future, you know, career or, or life plan is. Sure. Thank you. Um, it's been a, a great addition, I think. And again, as we said, you know, very timely. And we're going to have some really updated I have no content for the students as we move forward. Uh, Dr. Dolan, how do you think kind of this, the current climate we're finding ourselves in, COVID-19 and, and just all of us learning about this, will change kind of the medical fields a little bit or the way we prepare or act for future pandemics? Uh, well, before I jump into that, I just want to say my hat's off to the um, professors at Monmouth um that that are that are coping with this i think it's really great to maintain what i think was the big value that i got from monmouth which is that personal relationship with my professors and instructors and to be able to continue that kind of relationship uh, remotely so my hat's really off to that and i'm also really excited to hear about uh, this public health program and particularly epidemiology because um, we, you know, you can really uh, fool somebody with statistics and in this time especially, um, and one of the things I spend some time on in my blogs is trying to let people know like what we're looking at and, and how to look at these numbers. I mean, for instance, when you look at the, the COVID-19 statistics, the denominator is extremely important and people have written papers on the COVID denominator. What is the denominator? What are we talking about there? It makes a huge difference when people have a perception of what's the incidence of illness, what's the prevalence of illness, you know, what's the death rate? These are all very different denominators. So I'm really excited to hear about that course of study. But to answer your question, I think that more than anything, this pandemic is showing up how medicine has already changed. It was changing all along, and this just makes it extremely evident. And by that, I mean, when I graduated from Monmouth in 1980, I came out of there not only with a degree in chemistry and English, but I came out of there with an ability to think, an ability to analyze. Uh, knowing that something can be looked up and I can find out. In other words, I learned how to learn. And then I went to medical school from 80 to 84, and I was about the last generation of doctors that were also taught that way in medical school. Now, what's happened over the last four decades is medicine has transformed into 
following algorithms and protocols. And these are dressed up with various names, such as best practice guidelines or evidence-based medicine or whatever. And there was just starting to be a very rational backlash to that because what happens now and I wish uh, that uh, other graduate was still on the line to counsel, uh, to, to ask her about, consult her about her current experience. But what's happening now is you have about 20 years worth of doctors who weren't taught to think. After seeing 40 to 50, maybe 70 patients in a managed care setting, they do not go home and read the New England Journal of Medicine or the Lancet or the Annals of Internal Medicine. They're not analyzing the article to look for sources of bias. They have not been taught and do not understand the statistics that they're being fed. And therefore, they tend to look at the title, the abstract, maybe the conclusion, but never get into the meat of the article. And, and therefore, they're just going by protocols or, or algorithms. If this, then that. Medicine has transformed to that. And we're really seeing that in this pandemic now as everybody's going, what does the CDC tell us? What does the WHO tell us? I'd like to point out that the head of the NIH, Anthony Fauci, hasn't seen a patient in real life practice in decades. Okay, I followed his career since the 1970s. So we really have to develop a healthy skepticism and learn how to think again. And I think that that's the value of an education at Monmouth College, if it's anything like it was when I was there. What I got from it was the ability to to learn how to learn so that I can take on any topic and tackle it with confidence because I learned how to learn. I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank you. And I, and I appreciate, I think, the spirit in which you remember Monmouth and the experience is alive and well. And I think that that is definitely what I hear so many of our graduates saying. I knew how to think critically and I knew how to participate in a conversation even when I didn't agree and it not become, you know, a, a conflict and learn from others' viewpoints that maybe I didn't share. So it, it is what the residential liberal arts experience is all about. And I know our faculty are doing a tremendous job trying to still take that individual experience to the students, even though they can't be physically with them right now. Can I do a little shout out to my beloved professors? <laughs> Go right ahead. From Dr. Peter Gebauer, who was head of the chemistry department at that time, he really modeled professionalism. And I've never forgotten it and always think of him in that light. Really appreciated what he did for us in that department, professionalism. Uh, from Jeremy McNamara in the English department. Um, again, just really modeled um, the uh, doing the best you can, putting, putting the absolute best foot forward and presenting something uh, as if it was going to, you know, be presented at the highest society or on stage or whatever, uh, and, and not just some paper that was due on Friday. So again, there's that aspect of doing the best you can in professionalism. And finally, um, Ben Schauber, who's now deceased, he was actually emeritus professor by the time I was there. We had a very, very close personal relationship. And, and more than anything, he, he really taught me that, um, that if I follow certain procedures, I can know any subject that I had the desire to learn. Mm -hmm. And so just, just want to uh, acknowledge those particular individuals. Thank you. I know that um, those that we can still share that with will really enjoy that shout out. And I bet you will probably get a lot of comments on the video from folks who share your sentiment and want to give their shout outs to their favorite faculty members and just those that had a huge impact because that is, that is truly still the experience we, we hear from all of our alums just the same. And as we think about our faculty, I do want to pass it over to um, Professor Shum and ask, you know, as we are, are looking at this experience, you know, are there some takeaways you think we might have or are there changes in the curriculum or changes in our teaching methods that we may see as we've all kind of quickly been exposed to new technologies or other ways of delivering the information to our students? Yeah, I, for me personally, at least, I, I see, you know, several different assignments, different things I've done, um, some of the methods here that 
I think I'm probably going to keep or at least try to keep elements of those in the courses even once we start meeting normally again. Um, because I think uh, you know, it's just forced me to sort of experiment with some things that I might normally um, sort of feed them the information. And I've probably challenged the students a little to to sort of read and absorb a little bit more on their own just because of the circumstance. So uh, I, I think maybe we can do some of that, pull some more of that in, and then we can uh, you know, expand what we're doing in class or make it a little bit different. Um, you know, maybe on sort of experiential stuff because we can get more outside of the classroom. So, you know, th there's definitely elements I see here that could that could change some things. And it also, I, I think the situation can help us frame some of what I teach differently in that, you know, it seems that with this particular virus that um, if you have some, you know, certain chronic medical conditions and issues, at least statistically it appears, you might be more susceptible to, to having the severe form or severe case of this. And uh, many of those things that we talk about, like type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease and obesity, uh, have a big lifestyle, at least influence. You know, no one can 100% protect themselves from those things necessarily, but the things that I talk about a lot, nutrition, physical activity, exercise, those sorts of things, have a profound influence on some of those other medical conditions. And so I think this was just another aspect or another way we can sort of um, frame this or, or even provide an incentive for students and, and hopefully the future patients and clients of our students to say like, hey, there's a reason to, to at least take as much control of your own health as you can um, in terms of your lifestyle and the things you do, because not only will it prevent or help decrease the effect of some of these chronic diseases, but, you know, for whatever the next pandemic is, you know, hopefully there isn't one or it'll be a long, long time, but we never know. But again, there's a chance that you're, you're going to be a, a little bit less risk if you can keep yourself healthier because you don't know when this next thing is coming because, you know, six months ago, I don't think any of us saw this coming necessarily as far as I can tell. So uh, I, I think there's lots of uh, aspects here that are going to help both in the pedagogy of teaching, but then also the, the context of what we're teaching as well. Gotcha. Well, as we try to think about wrapping this up, I want to come back to you each with just a, a last thought. So Moira, would you have any kind of words of advice or, or a final thoughts to share with any of those folks watching today? You know, right as this was striking, I was launch. I was uh, heading out on a book tour, a 20-city book tour for my new book, uh, Boneheads and Brainiacs, Heroes and Scoundrels of the Nobel Prize in Medicine, okay? And I was thinking, darn, I wish, it, I wish we were launching this in the fall because that's when the Nobel Prize is newsworthy. But it turns out this is tremendously pertinent right now because what the book does is it encourages people to develop a healthy skepticism to, to really um, evaluate who it is that is um, counseling our government and political leaders and what sort of uh, medical things that go on uh, are really medical and scientifically based and which things are in fact political. And you, you learn in this book that there were, you know, Nazis and eugenicists and, and some real uh, boneheads and people who were dead wrong and, and, and people who had no sense of, of helping humanity. Now, there were also the brainiacs and the brilliant people and, and the heroes. Um, and, and medicine is really a mix of both. One thing I'd like to say about COVID-19 is, is to help people really listen to what's being said in the media and try to identify what's a medical and scientifically based uh, policy recommendation or statement compared to what's political. And one main example of that is in this country right now, no matter what the attending doctor determines is the immediate cause of death, if that patient also tested positive for COVID-19, our government 
is requiring that that get listed as a COVID-19 death. Now that's not the case in all countries. Um, and so you have all these, again, different denominators and, and different numbers floating around. That is a political decision. That is not a medical decision. It would be the equivalent of saying anybody who has the HIV virus who dies of any cause that gets counted as an AIDS death. And if we did that, there would be a global pandemic, okay? So for people to really acutely listen and look at what is medical and what is political and to develop some discernment there. And for more information, I'd uh, refer people to my blog. It's simply moiradolan.com. Thank you, Moira. I appreciate that. How about, Sean, would you have any final thoughts for those watching, words of advice, maybe even to our students? Yeah, um, I would echo what Dr. Dolan said. It's actually something that I talk about in many of my courses. You know, if you're going to be a future doctor or anything, um, at least ask questions. Be an educated consumer of, you know, the medical industry, if you will. Um, that's not the that I encourage everyone to to think they know more than their physician, but at least I want them to know enough to ask the right questions and to be educated. So, um, Sean, we got to get together. Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, I, I want my students and my graduates to be the people that innovate the, the fields of, you know, uh, in, that innovate in medical fields, whether it's as MDs or as physical therapists or athletic trainers. I want them to be the innovators because they question the current status quo. And maybe there's good reasons why we do certain things now, but I think students should understand those whys. But even as consumers, I want them to, to be educated. But, you know, other than that, I would just tell my students, like, hey, take a deep breath and relax. You'll get through the rest of the semester. It'll be okay. Um, rest assured, we're all going through the same stuff. Um, and so, you know, just keep learning. Um, yeah do your best, but also realize that, you know, there's probably a more important thing in your life than your grade in my course right now. And it's okay. You know, do what you need to. And, um, you know, and, and it, it'll be okay because I think sometimes reading your, and, and listening to the media reports, we can stress ourselves out quite a bit. Um, so do, you know, I would just tell my students to do what you can to take care of yourself, control what you have control over Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, relax and, and enjoy the ride as much as you can in a very difficult situation, admittedly. So, um, and, you know, I hope to see them all on campus in the fall. We echo that as well. We cannot wait to have our campus full again with our students here. Um, we appreciate so much you guys joining us and, and sharing a little glimpse into the areas that you're working in. I know everyone is impacted in some way, but do appreciate kind of the words of advice and, and some good opportunity. And it's a great opportunity today to have just something else kind of in our news and in our way of engaging with one another uh, and what's been, you know, a very full time of, of all sorts of stories. So um, again, it's our fourth annual Scott's Day, a great opportunity to just engage with alumni, friends, faculty, staff, parents, students um, from Monmouth College, uh, and just kind of have this virtual event, this opportunity to come together in a way that we can all connect and share. We hope that you'll continue to follow through. We still have several hours tonight. We'll wrap it up at 11.53 p.m. Um, as we continue our Scott's Day of Giving. There is a website you can go to for more updates, which is monmouthcollege.edu slash Scott's Day. You can continue to follow us on our social media pages. Um, and maybe even if, if you want to share some of your favorite uh, faculty memories, even to this post, I know there's been some good call outs here and we appreciate that. So again, thank you so much for joining us to Professor Shum, uh, Dr. Dolan, and even Dr. Baker who had to jump out, I think, to go see some patients. Um, but we appreciate so much you joining us today. And again, all of those watching, uh, we'll come back to you again with more updates throughout the day. Go Scots.